John Ralph, welcome to Dialogues. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for, for joining me. I should say right at the outset that we're, we're colleagues and, and friends. Uh, I'm a, a, a long-term colleagues. fanboy. We're colleagues. Colle- are we going to keep it at that? Okay, well, yeah, perhaps yeah. we'll be friends. Let's we'll not friends. push it. Perhaps we'll see we how we feel at the end of this. By the end of this, yeah, okay. Um, at least kindly inquisitors, perhaps. But um, I just want to, obviously, we've been talking a little bit through work recently, but I, I'd love to know how, how your pandemic has been uh, as a self-described introvert. You actually wrote a beautiful essay about being an introvert, which I was shocked <laughs> when I looked it up to discover it was from 2003. And my son is an introvert, and he says the pandemic, leaving aside the obviously the tragedy and so on has been the revenge of the introverts that suddenly it's a world for introverts how has that been for you which which son my eldest son the one who's in who's in the uk who's nearly 25 he changes all the time but um and he's I, he's a I, self-declared introvert so he loves I, it. I beg to differ the article you reference is called caring for your introvert and it's my most popular article ever and will go on my tombstone and made me the world's most famous introvert until susan came came along so now i'm, now I'm number two mm. It's it's not great. And the reason is that although it's, you know, nice to be spared a lot of small talk and a lot of daily interactions, I didn't actually mind that. It's an energy expenditure. It's not painful. It's just an energy expenditure. But I have a wonderful husband and a small house, and he is an extrovert, and I'm an introvert, and I've been in privacy deficit now for a year. Mm. Um, and the He's wonderful. Michael is great about, you know, not always being in my face and giving me lots of space. But it is just different when you're with someone all the time than when you're just, you know, completely alone. That's and that's true, been actually. that's yeah. been very hard to do. So so for both extroverts and introverts, there are different kinds of struggles. It's the introvert the the extroverts are kind of trapped indoors and the introverts are trapped indoors with the extroverts. Yeah. So it's sort of a lose lose in that sense. So Okay. Yeah. And it's hard for the extrovert too. You know, he's trapped with me and I, I can't give him enough of what he needs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that there are many people who are going to going through different versions of this and we'll all have learned a lot more about ourselves, each other and our relationships. Uh, yeah. Well, how about you? This. One of the things I do think it's done is it's exposed certain aspects of relationships. I mean, I think when you're busy, busy, everyone's running in and out and you're maybe not having so much time together, it maybe has exposed, you know, I, I see some people that are like, I can't wait to get it. You know, I need to get away from them, love them, but need to get away from them. And others that are like, this has been so amazing to be able to spend this time together. And I feel pretty fortunate to be more in the latter camp than, than the former camp. Although I think that to be fair, I think those who are caring for others, particularly you know, elderly people, but in particular small children, those are the ones who I, I think have really, I think that's been, you know, very, to my kids have grown. And so I don't, you know, how people have done that. I mean, there's been a drop in labor force participation of the parents of young children. The miracle is that they haven't all left the labor force, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? um, so, um, well, it's great to have you on. Thank you again. I'm flattered that you, you joined me for my still relatively new podcast and, and here to talk about your wonderful book, um, which I think captures it in some ways the main message in the subtitle. The book is called The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. Uh, and we're going to really get into the argument. I should say it's a wonderful book, John. I encourage everybody listening to, to, to buy it. It's written with your, uh, with your combination of intellectual rigor and real panache. So I congratulate you. I, I confess as someone who writes a little bit myself to... It's like feeling a professional envy, but I pref- I'd like to think that it's what Bertrand Russell called emulative envy. In other words, the kind of envy that makes you want to be more likely. <laughs> well, so, well, Richard, like every writer, my favorite kind of praise is being told that other writers resent me. Yeah, it's annoyingly well written, John, as always. Um, but I do. Want, it builds on um, a book from even further ago, 1993, Kindly Inqu- Inquisitors. But as I said, I think the difference is in the subtitle. This this. This is really a defense uh, of truth, um, and your sense, if, I, if I'm motivating the work correctly, is that the processes of truth formation, which you described before uh, in, in your previous book and since, not only need describing, they need defending. Uh, and so what, I'm, what I'd like to do is go through, in roughly this order, let's talk about what, the, what you call the constitution of knowledge is, great phrase, um, what's wrong with it, um, and then kind of what, what can we do about it. So if we can start with just kind of describing the constitution of knowledge, but I think there is a prior step, which is a new, in a way to take you back to 93, which you, you summarize much of your previous work here, which is the process by which we seek after truth, uh, create knowledge and so on, that, that it's a social network and so on. Can you talk a little bit about from your previous work and this work as to how you see that process before we get into the, the institutions that support it? 
Yeah. Do you want long answers, medium answers, or short answers? Oh, let's Some go for medium. Pretty then. hairy stuff. Get, if it gets too long, I'll start to. All right. You, I'll, I'll look I for mean, the do, spinning finger say, doing this when I special, need to scroll <laughs> Special faster. request is you've got to mention uh, you've got to mention the greatest philosopher I've never heard of, um, Charles Sanders Peirce. If I say his name, which you pronounce correctly, right? So. Previous book, Kindly Inquisitors, I call it my free speech book as a shorthand, but it's really not. It's really about where knowledge comes from in societies that are oriented toward truth and that are free and that are peaceful. And it says it comes from a critical exchange process. It's a very million book in that sense. And um, it says that this is a critical process and it often hurts. It causes pain and suffering because criticism is never fun and sometimes it's scalding. And it says we need to put up with that. And it identifies, now this is 1993, remember, a long time ago, it identifies several threats of which the most important and most relevant today is what I call the humanitarian threats. That's words that wound. That is, if you hurt me emotionally, or if you make me feel marginalized, for example, then you're committing a form of violence, and it's a human rights violation. And in Kindly Inquisitors, the reason for the title is that although that's an appealing idea in some ways sentimentally, it's a very bad principle um, for making knowledge because basically it criminalizes the whole knowledge-making process because it says whenever you offend somebody, you've got to stop. So that was that book. It used a model of where truth comes from, which is true, which is good, and which I stand by, but which turns out to be incomplete. And this gets to your work and your recent conversations about John Stuart Mill and his applicability today. Should I go into that? Yeah, well, look, let's talk a bit more about um, Peirce. Why is it Peirce, by the way, Warren? I mean, it sounds like Peirce, look, spelt Peirce. Why, is, why do we have to say Peirce? I don't know, because everyone says that's how to say it, so okay. I take it on authority. Fine, it's one it. of the things about being someone who knows about Peirce, is you, you say, say Peirce. Ah. It's, it's a way of keeping the outsider, making sure who's in the know and exactly. kind of who isn't. Right. Well, I do want to just, I mean, I, I want to come on to the institutions that support it, but, but I think it is very important just for those who haven't, you know, necessarily kind of read your previous book, although they should read, they should read both. Um, but this idea, why, why it matters so much to kind of keep allowing these sorts of contests. So this idea of fallibism as opposed to skepticism, kind of why just give us the sort of 101 version of, you know, this idea of why, why it's important to allow contest and, and... Well, well, Peirce is a good good place to do that. So let's do a minute on Charles Sanders' Peirce. As you say, the greatest philosopher that people have never heard of. Astonishing man, flourished in the late 19th century, basically invented what we now think of as network epistemology, but so far out of his time that he couldn't even get an academic appointment, mm. despite years of trying. So Peirce comes up with some very, very important insights about where knowledge comes from. He understands we can't reach it individually, even in principle. The only place you get knowledge is by comparing your worldview and your biases with other people. He says that by yourself, you don't know if, you know, the, the shaggy haired guy in the room scribbling equations could be Albert Einstein or he could be a madman. There's no way to know even in principle without comparing. But who does the comparison? his second great insight, no one in particular. You're going to outsource that mission to a network of people who are generally going to be strangers to each other. But the idea is used to use techniques of conversation that anyone can apply regardless of viewpoint and in principle come out with the same answer. So in the sciences, that's replicability. In law, that's anyone looking at the document should, they won't in practice, but they should in principle be able to reach similar conclusions about the case. In journalism, that's if someone else picks up my story and check it. Will they discover that I was accurate or will I have to run a correction? And he says, once you set up this network of independent, depersonalized checking where, where people are interchangeable, then you have something much larger than any human individual. You have a global network that basically takes on a mind of its own and knowledge emerges from that. And that's where objective reality actually resides, on this global network. So when I describe it, and you think of this as, you know, the 1870s, 1880s, you realize this guy was a century ahead of his time. Now this turns out to be very important because it's the foundation for where knowledge is coming from and the need for diversity of viewpoint. And it's also the focus of where the attacks on knowledge are coming from, which is efforts to disrupt this network. 
Yeah, there's this. I mean, this idea of no final authority, I think, is terribly important. And the idea of truth as a direction. You have a a lovely line when you refer to giving provisional deference to experts, and I think that's terrific because the qualifier there, which is a sense of like, okay, you seem to know what you, you know, you've been, you've got a PhD. You're, you know, let's say you're a Brookings Scholar. You've done years of research on this. Your work's been peer reviewed, and so on. So I'm gonna. I'm going to defer to you. I'm going to assume that you, John Roush, know a little bit more about X, right? Um, but it's provisional. At any moment, someone could say, you know what, Roush was totally wrong about that. You know, here's yep. the And anything I do to become an expert is something you should do in principle or be able to do in principle. We, we can't leave Peirce without mentioning the word you mentioned, fallibilism. Mm. Yes, Peirce unpack, kind of unpack that this. word. It's hard to say, <laughs> fallibilism. Fallibilism, yeah. yeah. There's a previous notion, skepticism, radical skepticism, which is unless we're certain, we can't have knowledge. And since nothing is certain, we can't have any knowledge. We can't really know anything. Along comes the fallibilist. This is Peirce and his successor. And they say, well, no, we can have knowledge. It just won't be certain knowledge. It'll be uncertain knowledge, but that will be even better because at any given moment we'll be able to, to, uh, to improve it. So any proposition might be fallible in principle, but if it sticks around a long time, despite efforts to debunk it, it's probably true. Hmm. And so that's how you're able to build up this massive body of knowledge that we enjoy today that gets you know me vaccinated against COVID-19 while still being open to rebuttal in the future. And this yeah. is a transformative concept, actually. It's basically the idea that we find knowledge by looking for mistakes. Yes, in the search for error. Yeah, you have a kind of lovely line there, too, where you say that it's about error. It's about the search for error um, rather than kind of search for truth. So you set out this idea of a kind of network epistemology that we learn through contests. There's no final authority and so on, but it's all pointing in the right direction. And then, then you turn to what you call the operating system for for liberalism and i think that word system is very important what are the kind of rules for turning disagreement into knowledge so you know so far i think we've set out what the principles are how does this well then but then you turn in this book in particular to okay but what's the what's the system how does this work what are the kind of institutions and norms and so on and that's partly why you prefer this idea of a constitution with an analogy to politics than the marketplace of ideas with the analogy to economics, right? Because you see it as a set of institutions and norms more analogous to the constitution of the country than to the marketplace of ideas. Is that, have I summarized that correctly? That, that's brilliantly summarized. And it gets to this interesting conversation that you've been having with John Haidt and others about Mill and about this notion of a marketplace of ideas and why it's a wonderful metaphor, but it's a completely off the same time inadequate metaphor. So this is so why do I need to come back to this after 28 years and write another book? It's not to make money. Partly it's because the challenges are new. Uh, Although I hope different. you'll make a huge amount of money, John, when everybody buys this book, <laughs> which they must and should. But anyway, keep going. If all your listeners buy this book, I will, I will get rich for sure. <laughs> That's true. But here's the other reason. So we got this notion that knowledge comes from freedom. And that all we have to do is sort of we all speak freely and we interact with each other and knowledge will result from that. And that's kind of like saying this is kind of my model in Kindly Inquisitors, which is it's like saying, well, how do you make a transportation system? Well, you get a bunch of cars and then people drive their cars and then the transportation system will emerge from that. We'll, we'll know, actually, you need roads. You need to paint the roads. You need traffic rules. You need traffic safety instruction. You need departments of motor vehicles. You need a lot of stuff, it turns out, to organize that system. And this is the piece where where Mill and the Free Speech School and then Holmes and the Marketplace of Ideas School are right about the importance of freedom and diversity as an input. They're not sufficient. You need a lot of structure and a lot of organization. And that's the constitution of knowledge. This is a whole set of norms and institutions that were developed over a period of centuries to give structures to our conversations about truth. Just having one-on-one -on -one dialogues, I love the premise of the show, I'm enjoying this dialogue, we're not going to get, that, get very far. What we need to do is have rules and systems that put us in contact through institutions with people and ideas all over the world where anyone can correct anyone. And that requires all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you have, this, you have this terrific line where you, where you write, 
I'll stop saying you have this terrific line from this point on, or, or if I do, I'll edit them out later because uh, it'll become annoying to the to the reader. But you say it's the uh, to the listener rather, it's the institution, stupid. And so you have a very much more institutional framework here. It's a bit like in economics, is, is, you know, the the models assume perfect symmetry of knowledge, frictionless plane, you know, etc. Um, but then institutional economics comes along and says, actually, you know what? There's a bunch of institutions here, and so I think of you as doing to kind of, to epistemology what. You know, institutional economists tried to do there you have four big areas you look at scholarship journalism government and law and they, they have very you know lots of overlap and lots of similarities and you have this kind of really nice metaphor for how the system works this kind of idea of a sort of st- pumping a pumping station that takes a bunch of stuff and filters it down can you can you describe that because i think it's a really nice image yeah so every undergraduate <clears throat> pardon me Allergy season. Hmm. Every undergraduate, when I talk, or I think when anyone talks about free speech in the marketplace of ideas, will say something like, well, so how do we know the marketplace will come up with the right answer instead of the wrong answer? And that's a very profound question, because it turns out, if you just leave people to their own devices to have these conversations, they'll do quite badly. They'll look for people who confirm rather than challenge their biases. They'll join tribes, go down epistemic rabbit holes and echo chambers, all kinds of things like that. So you need to figure out ways to get around that. And the person I look to is James Madison, who has this brilliant idea that the way you get both stability and dynamism in a political society is you require constant social negotiation about everything in order to get anything done. And you provide forums and institutions where that can happen. And that's the political constitution, not perfect, but works amazingly well. So it turns out the constitution of knowledge does something very much like that. It creates these structured conversations. Uh, I forgot what exactly the question was. I was getting to it long-windedly. Um, I was talking about that you, that you have this metaphor, this kind of image of a station. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it just takes this stuff yeah, and filters it. So yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. So how do we give this conversation a direction that tends to get right answers and not wrong answers? Well, each of these nodes, each of these institutions, or each of these academic conferences, or every newsroom, or every court of law is pulling in these hypotheses and ideas, and they're pulling in other hypotheses and ideas, and they're comparing them, and they're weighing them, and they're consulting with others, and they're sending them out for peer review, or they're saying to the journalist, have you called so-and-so? Have you checked with such-and-such? And then when they're done with that, they transmit it to other nodes, in the network. And they're like pumping and filtering stations where at each stage, there's no one way through it because it's a vast network. But if all of these pumps and filters are working individually to prefer the stuff that checks over the stuff that doesn't check very quickly, the bad stuff dies out on the network. You know, it's, it's not banned. You won't go to jail for saying it, but people lose interest in it. They'll just ignore it because it's not transmitted. It didn't pan out. And it turns out that system works very well at biasing the big public conversation toward truth. And that's the part I think Mill and his generation and a lot of us in the marketplace of ideas, idea, that's the part we forgot. You need all that stuff in the middle. You kind of presume, yeah, there's too much presumption there that would, I mean, you you say that it just doesn't happen by itself. It now kind of needs taken care of. I was actually thinking about the, one of the first jobs I ever had was working in a frozen pea factory. And all these these trucks would come in and they'd throw all the peas into the factory. But there was a bunch of other stuff in with it as well. You'd get snakes and snails and you know, branches and sometimes yuckier stuff. And it would go through all these places. It'd have to be washed. And then it would go through the conveyor belt. And my, my job was to sit in front of the... the the belt with all the and pick all the stuff off right take the frogs and twigs and stuff like that off right and then someone else would do it and they washed again and the idea is that it peas at the end and it's that's kind of the right idea right is you chuck I all love this that. stuff yeah yeah and hope the frozen that. peas come out at the end it's not always frozen peas but 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 it, there were a lot more frozen peas at the end than there were at the beginning my first job was as a newspaper reporter in north carolina and one of the things that i had to do was the assistant SETI editor would would send an AP story to me and say, check this, make sure this is true, if it was local. And I remember checking one of these stories. It was, you know, it's a very funny story, and it's too long to tell now. But the story alleged that that a, a uh, employee was held up at gunpoint and then locked in the trunk of his car and left for dead in a sub-freezing weather. And fortunately, the guy managed to escape by using some clever 
way to jimmy the car trunk open. So I called the I called over there and we were going to run it. Sound it. That, it doesn't sound that funny, but anyway, that, perhaps that's for another day. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, the funny part is, so I, I call the guy up, um, and you know, I assume he's going to say, "Yeah, that's all accurate," because the AP is it's usually pretty good. In this case, the guy, the guy says, "Well, not exactly. It wasn't late at night." It was, in fact, still daylight. I never saw the guy who held me up, so I don't know if he had a gun. He just said to drop some money. I did. He then told me to climb into the car trunk, which I did. I did not shut the car trunk. And I said, so you did not have to jimmy your way out? He said, no, I just climbed out. And then I said, so then you you were not at risk of freezing to death. And he said, no, that night it was 64 degrees. Hmm. So that's a valuable lesson. That's we filtered out. You, yes, you were doing you were doing the same thing as me. It was, I was picking frogs off, and you were picking untruths out of a out of a yeah, news story. Yeah. But the principle was basically the the same. And so I, I actually I think this is a really fresh way to look at it by comparing it to kind of Madisonian views about constitution. But there's a couple of a couple of things I wanted to press on. One is the, uh, an obvious problem is that there's no supreme court in the constitution of knowledge. Uh, in fact, definitionally there can't be because there is no final authority but if you do something that in the end is unconstitutional then it will find its way to the supreme court and the supreme court will say you can't do that it's unconstitutional and so there is a final kind of arbiter the hammer comes down but that doesn't happen here and so i just wonder to that extent the analogy doesn't doesn't work in fact in some ways the problem is that you could have multiple constitutions of knowledge, and in fact, I think you argue that's kind of happening. Whereas everyone can agree there is a constitution, whether you agree with the Second Amendment or not, or the Eighth Amendment or the whatever, right? It's there, like it or not. And if you want to fight it, you've got to go to court, and there is a court that's appointed and can decide. There's no equivalent at all in the constitution of knowledge, right? That's a problem, isn't it? No, it's a solution. It's also not completely true, but we don't have to argue about the place of the Supreme Court in the U.S. Constitution. As as we know, good, the court good, reads the election. I just returns. gave you the limit of my knowledge, which is much less than yours. So good, um, but but yes, the constitution of knowledge is obviously not written down. It doesn't have a court of review that decides what's true and what's false. But that's a strength, not a weakness. That makes it extremely hard for anyone to take authoritarian control over it. Now, it also means you've got a lot of fuzzy spots where people have to argue about what's true and what's not true and what's been established and what isn't and some questions like global warming, you have arguments about whether there even is an argument, and then you have arguments about whether the argument about the argument is actually an argument. So that that kind of stuff is going to go on. But precisely because it doesn't have a center, there's nothing you can grab hold of if you want to take control of the system. It's very frustrating to people like Donald Trump. And that's why in that respect, I think it's it's more distributed and more durable than the political constitution. Because it's decentralized, it's more yeah. uh, resilient. And I was thinking about the fact that in kind of revolutions, the first thing you do, seize the radio station or the TV station, right? Um, well, that only works if that's the single source of, of information and knowledge. But there's one other thing that occurred to me when I was, when I was reading about expertise and the way you talk about that in, in the book and the institutions whose job it is in medicine and science to be truthful and point us towards truth. But one criticism of those institutions, and I was thinking about this criticism has been made of CDC and NIH just in, in, recently in the pandemic by people like Zainab Tufekshi and actually Scott Alexander, uh, the blogger. Um, and in different ways, they make the same point, which is the trouble is that Fauci or anybody's in one of the government agencies, could be the Oceanic Agency, whatever, they have to optimize for two things. They have to optimize for the truth or you know, truthfulness, if we put it that way. But they also have to optimize for politics. They've got to have one eye on the White House and one eye on the press and so on. And that can lead them to very often actually be less reliable, uh, epist- you know, epistemologically, if you like, than the blogger or the person who doesn't have to optimize that. What do you make of that criticism? Because it's quite a striking one. If you're having to optimize, like if you're Fauci, you're not just thinking, what's the right public health? You're thinking, how do I handle the politics of WHO? How do I handle the White House? And so they're sort of political as well. Isn't that, is that a problem? Or is that a strength or a weakness in those institutions? I think it's probably like your view on this, um, and it's a new way of, it's a new question for me, but I suspect it's just one of those difficulties of life that any system is going to have trouble coping with. You know, the we deal with this at Brookings all the time, which is the the kinds of, the ways that researchers talk about research 
are different from the ways people talk about truth in an everyday context. Um, people are looking for crisp answers to yes or no questions, and, and we often can't do that, you know, where Truman famously asked for a one-handed economist. Um, so how do you mediate between the two when you're Tony Fauci and you're kind of stuck? The public wants to know, so mask or no mask, risk or no risk? What about outside? And the truth is, at that point, the science hasn't really figured that out. Yes. Uh, it's premature from the scientific point of view, but we don't have any time. So uh, so those I just think those interactions are always going to be difficult and they're always going to be there. You know, another a big one is climate change, yeah. where it's taken a long time to get the science where it is. And meanwhile, there are people saying, well, we have to act before the science is maybe completely ready. And other people are saying, well, then we could make a big mistake. So I don't know. How do we de deal with that? But that's not a problem with the Constitution for no with, of knowledge, I think, per se. It's just a problem of how these, these two very different sectors will always have to interact. Yes, although it does probably speak uh, to the need as part of the solution set, which we'll kind of come on to in a moment, but to, to try as far as possible to immunize those sorts of roles and those sorts of institutions from political pressure. To, uh, they're never going to be free entirely, but to make to try to the to mean that they're they the need to optimize for politics is much less right and that's why you have arms length in agencies and you've obviously written written a lot about this well let's let's move on then to what's ailing it right so a big part of the discussion in your book is what's happening to the constitution of knowledge that it's still here it's you know, it's 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 around for sure but it's taking some heat it's taking some fire and it's taking some fire from from both sides hence that your subtitle the need for a defense and part of that is a shift in what um john height calls the information ecosystem with social media in particular and just i'd like to reflect on that a little bit too because you do a nice uh, analogy there of what happens to the pumping station or maybe we can call it the pea factory now in honor of my job but <laughs> yeah, when, in a world that. of social media that's that, that does something quite profound to the direction of the factory right right suppose well let's say suppose you you're someone who has some type of political interest or profit interest in putting out a story that may be false but may advantage you or suppose you're a political demagogue or suppose you just don't like what science is telling you or what journalism is telling you, you know, perhaps it's telling you that humans descended from uh, some other mammalian ancestor and weren't created by God. Or suppose you're a Christian scientist and you believe that medical treatment is uh, is ineffective and, and unholy. There are lots and lots and lots of reasons not to like and not to trust the reality based community. That's these communities mm. of people and institutionals and professionals that are doing this process of filtering and pumping, or if you will, uh, separating the peas from the non-peas. And so there are lots of reasons not to like it. Well, one thing you can do is just to do what princes and priests have done historically, which is just to try to ban the stuff you don't like. Mm. Just take the whole system by the throat and put people in jail. Uh, that's not going to work very well in today's world. And it doesn't have to work very well. So the second half of the book is about the things that you can do in today's world very effectively. And that's by altering the environment in which the pumps and filters or the pea sorters are operating. So, for example, what if you just thrush, throw so much garbage at the pea sorter that he can't possibly keep up? He drowns in garbage. Yeah. You know, you can't even find the peas in there. You give up. You don't know what a pea even looks like anymore by the time, you know. You can't tell a pea from a stuff. snail by the end of it. Yeah. Or suppose they put a lot of fake peas in with the real yeah. peas, you know, plastic peas. Um, so they can do stuff like that to spoof the system. Or suppose they change the incentives around. So you are start to feel afraid to pull out the peas. You know, someone kind of threatens you and says, well, you know, there's lots of non-pea stuff that we want to have in our product here. And I think you'd better, who are you'd better you let to, some of that Who are you through. to say what should be in a bag of peas? Yeah, there's that method or just out and out intimidation. So these are fumbled but or strained analogies to the tactics that are now being used against the Constitution of Knowledge. And there are a bunch of them. But the big two are disinformation. And that's Donald Trump and his troll armies and conservative media, much of conservative media. And the other is social intimidation. And that's left. Yeah, well, let's take let's take them into that. Let's do the right. Let's do the right first. Let's do troll epistemology. You quote Steve Bannon, 
um, you know, famously saying that we should flood the zone with shit, which is basically, I think, what you were kind of referring to, which is just to kill. You know, the, the line is, the goal is not to persuade, but to bewilder and just leave people just a sense of, I have no idea. It's like a, a soup of uncertainty, post-modernity gone mad. Like, no idea, right? Just, just, and it doesn't matter. There are like the 17 reasons why this is untrue. It doesn't matter if they're mutually, it, just, it doesn't matter. It just talk, talk a, li- a little bit about how that happened I and mean, where did that come from where did this idea that you could just flood the zone come from I mean, it's clearly been pretty successful but what's, yeah, the, what's yeah. the history of that it goes back at least to the time of lenin um the nazis used tactics like this massive lies on a very large scale disorient people the notion here is that it's not always necessary to convince people of things that are actually false though it's nice if you can do that But you don't need to. You can just confuse them and disorient them. So they can no longer tell truth from falsehood. They no longer know who they can trust. They become cynical. They throw up their hands. They become open to demagogues and false information. Uh, They become divided and demoralized. Russians develop those tactics. They call them active measures. Uh, Vladimir Putin is a master of them. Here's the thing. We never saw that in American political life until Donald Trump came along. We started seeing it actually before Trump. We started seeing um, in the internet world, you know, we'd we'd see these words like shitlords. I thought, well, what's a shitlord? Well, shitlords are people who put out so much garbage that's so offensive that no one can keep up with it. And, you know, you just spend all your days trying to to catch some of the shit and intercept a little of it. Um, And Putin's doing this in the 2016 election. The Russians are doing it. And their goal is to divide America, not to especially persuade us of anything, but to set us against each other. Then comes Donald Trump. And this is a game changer. And it's a big reason I wrote the book, because Trump is, I believe, not a kind of fool, not a kind of big dummy who got lucky, not a pathological liar. He is a master of propaganda. I think the greatest since the 1930s. He adapted these tactics, what what Rand researchers have called the fire hose of falsehood tactics that had been used so well by Russians, he adapted them to the American context. He runs a political campaign in 2016 in which astoundingly, of all the things he says that fact checkers can check in the campaign, more than half are entirely or mostly false. I mean, think about that. Most of what he's saying is untrue. The first thing he does when he's elected, is he lies about the size of the crowd in the inauguration. He lies about whether it rained. Easily checkable things. Yeah. He's not trying to persuade anyone. He's trying to spoof us all and create a sense of confusion, disorientation, cynicism, which he then uses to divide the country and to motivate his supporters. And this all comes to a head, of course, in the 2020 election campaign, which is the largest, by far the largest and most successful disinformation campaign ever run in America. So I'm going on too long. No, I wanted wanted to come to that because I think there's a, you do draw out an important distinction here. And these are probably my words, not yours, between fake news and false news. And Trump really brilliantly obscured the difference between the two. You have the example of the 2018 awards where they had all the fake news awards. And it turned out that most of them were, they were news items that had been, that were incorrect um, and had been a bit been corrected. And so there, there's a huge difference here between misinformation and disinformation uh, is that you can be misinformed, but if you're to spread disinformation is to knowingly spread stuff that's probably not not true and keep doing it. And so that's, but, but, but brilliantly, he attached fake news to just everything, right? Any retraction meant it was, it was fake. And he, he'd do that from the beginning. And it turns out that that was just so prescient of him because it just meant, you could say, I mean, even my own family could just, you know, you know, my, my son actually said to a kind of family member of ours, he was talking about the fact that, well, actually vaccine resistance is kind of slightly higher. It looks like among like white evangelicals, I think. And you know, if he's quoting some guy, I'm sure oh, that's, just, that's just fake news. So, well, it's a decent poll and no, fake news. And so it became this just brilliant way to just dismiss anything, anything you disagreed with. And, I, you know, we've all had those experiences where you're like, well, it's pretty good research. So is it fake? <laughs> it's... It's brilliant stuff, Richard. I try to emphasize that that what's going on here, these tactics, we're talking about very sophisticated manipulations of our cognitive and social defects. This stuff that Trump and 
uh, and his troll armies are up to, they're taking advantage of some deeply wired in difficulties that human beings have discerning truth in a social environment that's been discombobulated. So one of Trumpisms and one of the propagandist great strengths in this situation, they don't need to care whether a proposition is true or false. Traditional propaganda, you're trying to persuade someone of something that's false. You're kind of paying tribute to truth in a sense Mm -hmm. by denying that truth or spinning that truth. This type of propaganda, you don't care if it's true or false or a mix. Whatever goes viral, whatever serves the purpose of causing confusion and disorientation will work. So it can be partly true. It can be entirely false. It can be misinformation. It can be disinformation. It can be pink jello. It doesn't matter. Right. Just throw enough. All it has to do is work. Just throw enough of it around and and it'll it'll And make it outrageous enough so people can't stop talking about it. They're very good at hijacking your brain. That's what trolls have figured out. They're sophisticated, too. They realize that if you outrage people, they will feel a need to defend themselves. It's very hard to resist that, even if even if you know you're being manipulated by the neo-Nazi who wants you to come and counter protest so that the neo-Nazi will get in the newspapers. It's still very hard to say, well, I'm going to stay home and ignore the neo-Nazi. Yeah. So that's what that, they're up to. One thing they do along the way, of course, is to this is to actually undermine even the provisional deference that tends to be given to, to experts. You know, again, to drawing from personal experience, I'm having an argument about the distributional effects of the Trump tax bill with, you know, again, a kind of another family member. And I'm quoting some numbers about what proportion goes to the top 1% and, and so on. And this family member, he's like, well, I don't know where you get your numbers from, you know, but that's, that doesn't sound right. Like, look, I, and I said, like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't like to play this card very often, but I'm a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings <laughs> Institution working on inequality. So I just like, do I get, do I get even a slight bump in credibility? There are many, many, most issues where I don't expect to get any bump at all and where I would definitely provisionally defer to you. But along the way, this troll is flooding the zone with shit has undermined to some extent, even that idea of provisional deference to experts. Especially that idea. Yeah, Yeah, that's the goal here, to flatten all of these institutions and the notion of expertise, the notion of professionalism. You know, Trump pulls out a weather map and falsifies it. Yeah, I mean, we all smile. I find myself smiling when I'm saying we're laughing, but actually we shouldn't really laugh. We shouldn't be laughing because what he's saying is, you know what? I know as much about the weather as any expert. No one is in a position to judge the weather any better than I am. And by the way, I'm president of the United States, so I can do this. And by flattening all these institutions, by denying the existence of expert knowledge, by denying the professionals know anything, once you've flattened all that, then it's easy to use or easier to use your political and demagogic power to get what you want. And as we see, Trump now, he's got, what, 70 percent of the Republican Party? believing that the election was stolen. Right. 100% false. The only person that benefits is Donald Trump. It's yeah. a, just a, it's a fantastic and very scary success that he's had. And a yeah, significant number believing, I think half of the Fox News watchers believing that uh, Bill Gates is using the vaccine to yeah. put a chip in them and so on too. Yeah. So I think right that- now, we can make this very concrete, Richard. Right now in my home state of Arizona, there is a fourth recount of the presidential vote happening, except this one is not happening in the standard way with legitimate experts who know what they're doing with outside observers of the two parties and journalists who can watch what's being done. This one is being done only by Republicans in a closed room where only, I believe, one America network, a conspiracy network, is allowed in the room being done by people who have never been heard of it's a group in Florida. Nothing is known about them. And we're supposed to take their word for it. And that's because Republicans have decided, well, we don't need the standard experts. They just went out and got someone to do their own, to do this crazy exercise. Um, Democrats are calling yeah. it the fraud it, which is what it is. But this is what you can do when you knock down the idea that anyone knows anything about how to do this. Yeah, if, if you say, well, that's my, my opinion, I'm entitled to it, and everybody... Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But let's switch to the left now, because if the problem from the right is flooding flooding the, flooding the zone, 
the problem on the left is actually, you know, in some ways a tighter filter, right? So it's the taking off of the filters on the right and just let, and flooding it. Um, but on the left, it's the application of tighter and tighter filters, you know, so-called cancel culture and so on. Um, and you talk quite a bit about about that in universities and so on. I was so interested in the corporate examples too, actually. And one example in particular, the Mozilla CEO. And this is a really great one for you because the reason it was Brandon Ike, I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, but he was CEO for a... I think it's pronounced Purse. Uh, Purse, Brand- everything's Purse. Brandon Purse, the CEO of Mozilla. He was booted I think, out I after... I think it's Brandon a- Ike, yeah. Ike. He was be- booted out very quickly. Um, in 2014, a few years earlier, he'd made a donation to an organization campaigning against the idea of equal marriage, same-sex marriage. Um, and he was booted. There was a boycott campaign and so on. Now, you spent three decades of your life, at least so far, arguing for gay rights and in particular for equal marriage. And so one might think you would be on the side of those who thought he should go, but you come down exactly on the opposite side because of your uh, your view that uh, gay rights would not be helped by that kind of thing. So you come to the defense of this guy who was against the thing that you'd spent three decades campaigning for. Unpack that for us. That's a great example. It sounds complicated when you put it that way. So, yeah, I'm <clears throat> I'm proud to say that in real time, I and others in my world, gay marriage world and gay friendly world, were alarmed by what happened. So just for listeners who might want a little bit more texture, uh, you describe the situation accurately. Uh, Brandon Ike is named CEO of Mozilla Corporation. Some people discover that six years earlier, he gave a donation to Prop 8 in California, which overturned same-sex marriage. This was at a time when Barack Obama was against gay marriage. Most of the world was. This is weaponized on social media. Ike is fired and Mozilla apologizes for ever hiring him. And some people, including me, write a public letter, gay people, gay rights people, saying this is not the way to handle this. Um, if, If you try to stigmatize and shut down these conversations, we will lose the opportunity to convert the people we need to talk to. And we will be behaving like the people who oppressed us, who use social coercion to keep us in the closet to keep us frightened. We don't want to do that to others. That's not what we're here to do. The thing is, though, Richard, at the time, I kind of thought, well, this will happen now and then. And then someone like us might write a letter objecting to it. But, you know, it's just one of those occasional outbursts that happen. What we didn't realize in 2014, but have come to realize since, is that we were seeing the debut of another powerful new disinformation weapon. Actually, it's an old disinformation weapon. It goes back, it's described by Tocqueville, described by John Stuart Mill, Mm -hmm. which is using social intimidation to make people afraid to say what they think, thus manipulating the environment so that it looks like you have a consensus that isn't a real consensus. It's false consensus. It's manipulated consensus. People are afraid to speak. Spirals of silence. Um, So that begins to happen in a big way in America. Mm. It starts on college campuses. It doesn't end there. It's turbocharged by social media, which make it possible to gang up on anyone instantly, demand their firing. You can get hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of demands that someone be fired or ostracized or shamed overnight, literally. And these are often quite effective. Result is that polls are showing that two-thirds of college students and over 60% of Americans report that they are afraid to say what they think about politics on some subjects for fear of social sanction. And that is not the world that we want to live in, especially if you're a minority like gay people, you know, who need to use our voices to speak out against injustice. Because it was to break those spirals of science that the liberation movement um, was successful. And, uh, and I think that social media clearly just turns what it, what it does is it, you can have instant mobs. Um, You know, there was this idea of flash mobs for a while where people would kind of get together physically, but you can create an online mob almost instantaneously. And so that, that means the social coercion can be incredibly uh, quick and incredibly fierce. But, is there some at some point though are there certain views of the world which have moved on sufficiently whereby one would feel differently about that and so although it's it's an obvious counter I'll make it anyway if uh, Brandon Ike had contributed to a group that was campaigning against 
uh, marriage across racial lines, for example, if he was against mixed race marriages, would you make the same argument that we should allow him to, you know, we should defeat that argument on its merits and has nothing to do with his role as CEO uh, as Mozilla. Whereas the gay marriage uh, argument was still very much in play, right? And still very much contested and d debated over. Whereas obviously the one on race is left behind. And will there, does that mean at some point that it might become okay? Uh, perhaps not in the way that it happened, but to say, you know what, if you're the CEO of a major company, then there are certain views that are beyond bounds. So, Clearly, if you think that interracial marriage should not be legal, you won't be named CEO of Mozilla to begin with, because that debate has been settled. And liberal science, the constitution of knowledge, the system that we've been talking about, has a very effective way to deal with this problem, which is you, you don't punish people, you don't deprive them of their livelihoods or kick them out of their house. But, you know, they basically find themselves drifting to the margins of society because they believe crazy stuff and People don't really want that around. Um, they're free to believe it. They're free to go on about their business, provided that they don't hurt people. But they won't get these mainstream positions necessarily. And that's, you know, not because we hate them and punish them. It's just because they're weird people. So those things work themselves out over time socially. And sometimes they work themselves out unjustly. Sometimes it turns out these fringe figures have something important to say and are right. That's where Mill is so important. We need to always remember that that crazy person out there might actually have the cure for AIDS, right? It could happen. That's why we always leave the door open. But we also allow knowledge and society's uh, views of knowledge to accumulate over time in ways that sort of, you know, people, basically we ignore people who say a lot of crazy shit. They get marginalized, one of, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things that's so effective as a disinformation tactic about trolling. Trolling is where you deliberately outrage people in order to get them to respond to you. Hitler was brilliant at this. Trump is brilliant at this. No parallel implied. Um, what's so dangerous about that is that that hijacks our brains and hijacks the agenda and draws all the attention to precisely those ideas which left to themselves would just subside into darkness because you know, no one would care if a few hundred Nazis believe the Holocaust didn't happen. It just wouldn't be that important. Mm. So what trolls have discovered is that they can use social media and digital media to draw attention to themselves and use this outrage impulse as their great publicity machine. And that's something new. And that's something worse. And it makes it much harder to marginalize these figures. Yeah, because they can get strength in numbers and velocity and so on kind of, uh, online. But you've talked, you had to do write a little bit about the one way to, to deal with getting, we're getting a little bit now into some of the solutions, but you talk personally about the way in which you try not to take offense, right? You say, you say something like, actually, if you have a society where people are very easily offended, then it's much easier to be offensive. It's trolls paradise. Yeah. That's what they love. They love going around and setting off people's outrage. And um, that's what they do for a living. And so, yeah, a key part of the answer to this is just don't overreact. Don't, don't pay that much attention to them. The more you ignore them, the more you disempower them. I think you say something like very often, the, very often although not always, the best, the best answer to a Holocaust denier is, is crickets. It's Crickets, empty yeah. halls and yeah. no response. And, and that yeah, kind of and I also, right. I also talk react. about ridicule, ridicule, yes. sarcasm, irony, greatly underused. I want underused. to talk to you about that. Because that really, so you have a fantastic example of it. In Knoxville, Tennessee, there was a white supremacist march. I didn't know about this. I love this example, um, which is that there was a group of people who, in response to this white supremacist march, created uh, a group of people who were called, what were they called? The Ku Cl I can't put klutz clowns or something. Yeah, um, I think it's the clue cl klutz clown. I'd written it down to so cl clowns, yeah. And they were in, cl in um, clown outfits. And when the white supremacists were shouting white power, they pretended to mishear them and they shout white flower, white flower. And they show flower everywhere and so on and just kind of do that, which I I mean, maybe it's partly because cause I'm, I'm British and there's such a strong uh, tradition of satire as a way to kind of deal with politics. I do think it's understated, actually, this movie, I watched it again the other night, Four Lions, which just mocks uh, jihadism 
And some research that was done when I actually ran a think tank called Demos over in London by some of my colleagues, Jamie Bartlett, showed that particularly for young men who might be attracted to a certain cause, mockery, making it seem ridiculous, is very powerful because there's this sense of meaning that they get from it and so on. This is, this is a great cause, whatever the cause is, right? You're rallying to it. And young men in particular are very vulnerable to that. So if you just, as the Brits would say, take the piss out of it, make it ridiculous, <laughs> then it's quite powerful. But we don't do that very much. We do it less, actually. I think it's almost... Well, Brit- it's almost I think the British, the Brits are better at this than the Americans, right? I mean, Americans are so earnest... So and so eager to show that we're you know we're committed to our cause and and justice and and all these but things. getting we're more free so. the country. Do you think it's getting more so? I think we think now like isn't isn't like the clown example. I thought that was fantastic, but I can imagine people saying, actually, you know what, white supremacy is no joking matter. Uh, you know, and you here's you two white guys. You think it's funny, but let me tell you that if you are a person of color, and so actually, it's almost as if you can't risk even poking fun at these horrible ideas for fear of being seen somehow to trivialize them everything has to be incredibly earnest everything has to be inc- everything has to be taken to defcon 1 basically in the culture war yes and you've got to leap forward and show your commitment to the cause by being quick to denounce whatever it is that is being denounced that day um, the guy you know the the adjunct law professor at georgetown who was fired for simply not objecting when someone else said something that was not in fact objectionable but which got her fired everyone gets fired so yeah this this is a problem i think Richard. did you watch We're, that video though did you did you see it i did yeah yeah i came out of it slightly differently i mean uh, leave we can leave aside what um what the kind of sanctions were but i went to it thinking yeah this is this is another kind of made up and i listened to it and i thought hmm yeah i i didn't i didn't like what she said to be honest but um you know because i always try to go back quite what i realized was this thing was flying around on twitter and i thought maybe i should actually watch the video you know there's so many occasions when you actually think i need to go back to the source uh, and you have to dig down rather than to get it and i watched it and i i don't know maybe it's her tone maybe it was the particular words she used was it in indi- what should she be indicted for i don't know but i didn't think it was quite as innocent as some people kind of implied when I watched it. But let's talk a bit more about um, solutions, though. You have this great, great point where it doesn't take care of itself. The constitution of knowledge doesn't take care of itself. It needs a strong and positive defense. And you've talked about how the social media revolution meant it was spewing bilge instead of filtering it. Great. 2016, wake-up call. Oh, oh, okay, or, or before then. And then you talk about uh, threefold defense. You talk about institutions, solidarity, and then individuals, essentially. So in institutions, you say that in academia, I'd say, you know, you describe yourself as n- not alarmed, but not f- fatalistic. But you do say academia is running out of time. Time is running out for academia to get itself sorted out in terms of this viewpoint diversity. Um, and, and you suggest they need to take aggressive action now to to solve the problem of uh, of sort of groupthink, basically, and actually, and you point to the fact that most Republicans now think universities aren't good for America, and so on. So, how how bad do you think it really is on campuses? Because I sometimes think that it's just a few of them, and we're overstating it. And most big publics are fine, and you know this is all just froth on podcasts. And other times, I look, look at it, and go, no, no, this really is bad. I'm a friend of academia. I work at a think tank. My my druthers would be to say this is a bunch of right wingers who are exaggerating political correctness, but I can't say that because the evidence is just become so clear, and there's so much of it that in at least certain important disciplines, in many if not most universities, there's no longer enough diversity of viewpoint. In other words, there aren't enough conservatives around anymore to ask the basic questions of the researchers so that they can catch their own biases. Remember, the genius of the constitution of knowledge is it pits bias against bias. We can't see our own biases. We can see other people's. And it forces us into this global organized conversation to search for each other's errors. But we can't do that if everybody in the, uh, for for example, uh, department believes that some questions just shouldn't even be asked or believes that all conservatives are are, are oppressors or what have you. You know, we can get into specific examples. The research will be bad and people will lose confidence in the research because they'll come to see it as politicized. And that's what's happening today. The 
Confidence in universities on the right uh, has dropped by something like 20 points in about five years. Mm. That's falling off a cliff. Some of that is attacked by Trump and Fox News, but some of it is the growing perception, not unwarranted, that some of these departments and disciplines are not on the level. Or at least they may be trying to be on the level, but they're no longer giving a, giving a fair shake to a full spectrum of viewpoints. Right. And I've heard this from students again and again. A particularly poignant one was an undergraduate at a famous liberal arts college who said that she was not getting exposed to conservative viewpoints on campus. She's liberal, but she wasn't seeing these viewpoints, hearing them, and that that bothered her. But she told me she took some solace because at least she was getting exposed to a variety of progressive viewpoints. And, you know, I just, I did one of the, I did the face palm. Yeah. But it's and all... I thought, that is not what universities are supposed to be in the business of. But it wasn't just Marxism, so that's, you know, that's, that's something. Although it looks like it might be getting a bit better. I was struck by the... Um, you know, the fire, red light, uh, fire is the foundation for individual rights and in education, which has a red light system for free speech. And actually, the number of red has gone down. I think you kind of quote these numbers quite significantly. So it does. And, and a number of universities are now signed the Chicago statement, which is a defense of free speech. It does feel like there's a realization, at least among many colleges this is a problem that they need to at least start addressing and in, and if they take your advice they'll deliberately hire more conservatives they'll have free speech code they'll they'll try and change their culture intentionally the problem's kind of morphed richard when i got into this all these years ago it was primarily radicals and ideologues on the faculty who were driving toward things like speech codes which they wanted to use to make sure that minorities weren't marginalized as they saw it in recent years, it's tended to become actually faculty in many cases that are more protective of free speech, but we're seeing more and more students who are demanding emotional safety when they get to college because they believe that certain ideas are, are hurtful and harmful and oppressive. And they're saying, protect us from these ideas. And we're also seeing a lot of peer pressure now among mm. these students. Um, and we're also, we've reached a stage where it's now possible in many disciplines, in some disciplines, for an academic to have gone her entire career without really encountering a conservative alternative point of view in, in the process of earning her PhD, for example, doing her dissertation, um, being peer reviewed. So you've got this combination of forces, which is narrowing the range of views that are being heard on campuses. And that becomes a problem both educationally, that is to say pedagogically, but also just in terms of are they doing the research? Are they asking all the right questions? Are they catching the biases? So, yeah, I think it's awfully important that universities start to fix this. Um, we are seeing encouraging signs on the free speech front. The Chicago principles yeah. now adopted by, what, 75 schools. But dealing with this problem of lack of diversity of viewpoint on campus, focusing mm. on every other type of diversity, but not this one, that's a newer problem. This has just recently been pointed out. It's much more... And the, we're a long way from dealing with the that. The peer pressure thing is much closer to what you, you were referring to earlier, the sort of tyranny of custom and so on. And I, and I see, you know, as I mentioned, I have kind of adult adult kids, various college age, and you do see that. It is, it is much more around this sense of self-censorship, of just the avoidance of certain topics. You, know, you quote, I think you quote a number of people saying it's kind of all downside. And so... It's what what actually happens, and I've kind of experienced this in my own life, is that my my own son sometimes will come home and talk to me about some of these issues because they wouldn't dare talk about them in the classroom because they wouldn't feel safe doing so. And and the fear is that they'll be branded in some way or another. And I should, you know, I should say that they're, I think, they're, you know, rel relatively moderate types. Um, but it's even like asking the question. And it's and and when you're young, especially, you know, that fear of being cast out, that fear of being ostracized is incredibly visceral. And so you've got people at just the right age as well for this this stuff, you know, just the age when you should be opening up actually is also the age when you are most sensitive to the idea of being cast out. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm seeing it more in that sense. It's less can Ben Shapiro go and speak on your campus or, you know, are we going to allow, it's more kind of what's happening among people themselves. It's that, it's the soft, the soft, the soft tyranny of social custom. It's, yeah, it's what Tocqueville described as the tyranny of the majority and what sociologists call spirals of silence, 
where people no longer know what other people think. They don't know where the real consensus is because they can't really have that conversation anymore. And then you get this intermingling where two things are going on and they feed each other. One is the lack of diversity we've talked about, where someone like your son may just not encounter other points of view. And that could be because other points of view aren't represented on campus, which I think would be true in some departments and disciplines. Or it could be because they're there, but they're not speaking up. But either way, the result is the same, which is they don't get the benefit, the million benefit of views encountering different views, which is what we call education. Yes. And I think, and even in some ways, an even worse thing can happen is that they do end up having those conversations, but in places that are considered to be safe, which have become separate bubbles. Right. And so you kind of see the situation where, you know, I've even seen it kind of happen professionally, honestly, where, you know, some scholars will come out of a seminar or something. I said, well, I didn't like to say anything in the seminar, but X. Right. And the reason they didn't want to say it was because they were afraid of being misinterpreted. Um, and so the speaker did not get the benefit of that counter argument. They, they censored themselves for fear of being censored. Yeah, so, yeah, but well, the conversation still happens. It just happens somewhere else among a well, group. It kind, of, think it kind of happens. It doesn't happen where it counts. You know, if it happens in private, it's exactly. not really very important. Exactly. No, that's the point. It, you lose the value of the collision right. of ideas. Right. Exactly. What's happening now, which is interesting, which I think may turn out to be a game changer, is it used to be at least perceived that you were in trouble if you were a conservative in one of these environments. But in the last few years, liberals, progressives have realized that they are also very exposed, that they don't know what they can say. Um, they don't know what might get them in trouble at any point. And there's a reason for that, which is, remember, it's so important to keep this front and center. This is all information warfare. These are all disinformation tactics. And the purpose of those tactics is not to draw bright, specific lines that people know how to avoid. It's to make everyone fearful and disoriented and demoralized all the time. So you never know what it is that might get you in trouble. It could be anything. It could be, I don't know, describing the sky as blue. That's the whole point. Yes. To create this atmosphere of fear and disorientation. And so on campus, even if you're liberal, you're never sure when someone is going to nail you for someone or what you can say and what you cannot say. And that's a very disturbing, disorienting environment. Just yesterday, I had a law professor telling me he wants to quit because recently the fun has gone out of it because he said his law students just will no longer have an open, candid, unbuttoned conversation in class because everyone is so worried all the time about getting in some kind of undescribable trouble from some indeterminate direction. And literally, this professor wants to leave because he says the joy is gone. But one result of that, I think, is that progressives, liberals are waking up to this problem and starting. we're starting to see some organizations that counter it. And that gets us to yes. solutions. A big one is counter mobilization. You talk about you say groups, right? You say it takes a group groups. to stop a group, counter mobilization. Now, we've talked a bit about Jonathan Hyatt and his work at Heterodox Academy. You're also closely involved with something called Braver Angels. Say a little bit about that and how that fits into this scheme. Well, they're a little bit different. Um, because they're a national, they're, they're a grassroots effort to depolarize the country by actually creating workshops and debates at the grassroots level where people can say what they feel and not be judged in a structured conversation. Structure is just so important in all of these things. It never works. Just put the people in a room. Hmm. But they're getting some remarkable results. Um, we have, we, I, I was on the board for until recently, chapters in all 50 states and these workshops that we do, where we use marriage counseling techniques, actually, to, to get people just to, to hear each other across the political divide, not to change anyone's mind, just to hear each other, just to connect as humans. The single most common thing that people say when they leave those rooms is we are not as divided as we've been told. Hmm. Remember, this is a distorted disinformation environment where polarization is being hyped all the time. But actually, there's a there's a in structured environments where people can encounter each other, we can reduce that. And there's a yeah. I'm just wondering. It's sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just well, I was just going to segue into other things that can be. Done. Well, I just lots want of lots this of point about structured, right? Because I think one of the, you know there's a famous Martin Luther King line about we're never more segregated than at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. 
And I think some people, um, you quote Liliana Mason in, in the book and so on, but there is work from political scientists showing that institutions like religious institutions have become more segregated politically as well, and that that's a problem, right? So maybe that is a structured environment, but through a voluntary organization or a religious organization or even a neighborhood association or something that you'll encounter people with very different political views to you. But because you are, you come at them with something in common, a faith, a, a zip code or whatever, that takes some of the heat out of it. But I'm hearing you say that, it, is, is that enough structure, I guess, is what I'm, I'm asking. Well, I, I, I pick up what I know out of, on this from Haight, from Haight, John Haight. Sorry, I'm getting tired, so I'm mispronouncing stuff. Mm. Um, so he's a better person to ask. But yeah, just putting diverse people in a room and saying, have at it, that ends badly. The trick is to put them in a setting where they have a common mission, where they have a common goal and are working on something together. And it turns out that common goal to work on together can actually be depolarizing the room. You can get a sort of positive, virtuous bootstrapping cycle of people working together to depolarize themselves. So that's what Braver Angels is doing. But there's a larger lesson there, which is, so much of what we've been talking about in the last hour is variations on the theme of information warfare, propaganda, disinformation, efforts to deliberately organize and manipulate the social environment for political gain. Knowing that that's going on and making rational, concerted and organized efforts to counter it works. Yes. There are individual things that we can also do, and those are also very important. Yes. But and a lot of it, but, a, but a, we have to do a lot of it together. We have to respond institutionally. And the good news is a lot of that is already beginning to happen. It doesn't mean the good guys automatically win. But if, if, if we have time, I'll reel off a couple of examples. If, yeah, I'd love to hear more. And then I want to push you a bit more on the individual, and then I'll probably let you escape. But give me some examples. Just to, to list a few, um, one of the great advantages that the trolls and disinformation warriors had in 2016 and that Trump had was they took everyone by surprise. Media didn't know how to handle that. They just put it all in the paper. They said, Trump says so-and-so. Um, now they have correspondents who are covering disinformation. They're being careful, much more careful about contextualizing, you know, Hunter Biden's hard drive had all the earmarks of a classic Russian propaganda drop, you know, Hard drive appears out of nowhere, winds mm -hmm. up in the shop of a blind repairman, just coincidentally at the height of an election, mm. from Rudy Giuliani. What does that look like? Mm. So they made some very discriminating determinations. Um, media is getting savvy about not just repeating stuff because someone said it. Uh, every journalism student now knows how to do a reverse image search to find out, so could this image have been doctored? These are things we didn't think about five years ago. We now have watchdog groups all over the world, a lot of them in academia, that are tracking disinformation, watching it, alerting other nonprofits, alerting the social media companies when they see it emerge instead of waiting it for it to work its way through the whole network. Um, we're seeing educational institutions are starting to respond, teaching civic liter literacy, um, digital literacy, more in other countries than here, but, but that seems to be effective just showing students how to ask some questions about what they're seeing online. Social media platforms are starting to do some redesign work. Um, you and Height had a very good conversation about that. There are no magic bullets there. But the good news is social media design could not be any worse than it was four years ago. It no, will only get better. And it's catching up. I mean, you say that it's taking on some of the institutions of the Constitution of Knowledge. You talk about the Facebook Oversight Board, which I'm super interested in, and I'm hoping to talk to someone from Facebook about that. But, you know, the retweets and, you know, they're, they're in the design. Certainly that's happening. But the last point, actually, is the in the third the third of your triadic defense. You talk about institutions and then groups. So then you talk about individuals, and you actually say, and I was I was pleased that you said this, that in the end, although institutions and organizing are essential, it comes down to individuals. You talk about our epistemic conscience. And you talk about how difficult it is to be open to criticism and humility and forbearance. And then you, you actually go back to medicine and talk about the need that the civic virtue, virtue, that actually the republic won't work without the virtues in the citizens. And so it feels to me that isn't that that's even more true of the constitution of knowledge than of the political constitution, isn't it? The virtues that are required here 
the epistemic virtues, the truthfulness virtues, is what Bernard Williams would call, call them, are even more important uh, that as individuals. Would so that leads me to my question is that this is always framed as an institutional crisis or a Trump crisis. And I wonder if it isn't, to a very large extent, an ethical crisis and one that we have to respond to as in. Yeah, I was, I was thinking a lot about that because it's something that you've talked to, uh, interviewed and discussed with John Haidt and, and with others. Um, and it's a very challenging question. And I guess I wound up thinking, Richard, I kind of think about it a little bit differently, which is I don't think even in principle you can separate the institutions and the individual. And the reason is that any given in individual will operate so differently depending on the incentive structures that are around them. You know, if you can take a perfectly civil person and put them in a academic conference where all the incentives are be polite, be systematic, um, be orderly, um, present data, or you'll get in trouble, or you'll, you'll, and you'll be rewarded for doing the right thing. You can take that very same person and put them on social media where the incentives are build a following by saying all kinds of bad stuff about people, display your solidarity with your group, um, show how outraged you are. And that same person will and often does behave very differently. So, yes, you absolutely need both. And at bottom, I think both of these constitutions, as the founders told us, rely on civic virtue and epistemic virtue. Things about caring about truth, mm. just, you know, not lying about stuff just to start out with, not doing disinformation, not doing social media pile-ons, uh, thinking before you retweet, having some humility, being willing to lose an argument and move on without punishing the person on the other side or trying to. All of those things are important, but individuals by themselves, I, I'm skeptical that they can promulgate those things on their own. I think they've got to be surrounded and enmeshed in societies and institutions that will reward, that will reward them for pro-social behavior. So I don't know, are, are these things really distinguishable? Well, you're right. really I mean, saying anything to try to pull them apart. No, you're right. So it's like, you know, there isn't, there's the John Rausch Brookings scholar, right? And then there's Brookings Institution and same for me and so on. But, you know, is there is there a clear separation? No. Um, incentives massively matter given the biases you've talked about, conformity biases, confirmation biases. I completely agree that the institutional incentives around information that we currently face in all kinds of environments are out of whack and need to be restored. I guess I'm just sensitive to what I sometimes perceive to be an overemphasis on the institutional fixes and an underemphasis on the need to look into ourselves and be a bit braver, a bit more humble, uh, look at work a bit harder. And I think it's because I, I, I suppose it's because I think of that more broadly as a challenge for liberal societies more generally, is that there is this sort of view about the institutions and the media and all that. But in the end, we should be very, very careful not to detract attention from, well, I suppose we talked about Mill and I try not to talk about Mill all the time in this podcast, but he said the worth of a society in the end is the worth of the individuals comprising it. And of course, that's an overstatement. But I sometimes worry that we might abdicate responsibility for our own epistemic responsibility, conscience, when it comes to it, when it comes to that difficult conversation, that difficult moment. Um, and I'm worried in particular that if we don't inculcate those virtues, particularly in young people through the education system, they're hard to acquire later. And maybe we've taken a few of them for granted. And that this, this idea of it being a virtue problem, a skill, as, as well as a institutional virtuosity problem, it just concerns me a little bit the way that it's framed. So I'm pushing, that's probably why I'm, I'm probably pushing too hard the other way, but I do, I worry a little bit. Like, fix the retweet button, hire more conservatives, have a better policy. Mm. You know what? It's also about how you and I have this conversation what we do and don't say, how we react when we lose an argument, and so on. So I don't, I don't want to take away too much individual responsibility. That's, I guess, my motive. So when I wrote the last chapter of the book, as you know, since you read it, I tried to have it both ways, and I tried to walk this line. And it's, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to say, look, we've got to behave better. 
and also say at the same time, which is also true, it's unrealistic to expect us to behave a lot better if our if we're in a social environment that's corrupting and disincentivizing good behavior. Um, so I tried to do both and stress both. I don't know that I succeeded. The end point of the book is Lincoln mm. and his imprecation to all of us that the Constitution could not last unless individual Americans believe first and foremost in the rule of law the sanctity of the rule of law. And Lincoln is basically saying there, you can get everything else right, but if people are go around and are, are lynching people, which is what was happening, what he was responding to, nothing else will really work. And I think that's true. And I think it's a version of saying what you were just saying. Um, so I do make that point, And I mm. do believe that point. There, There is one interesting difference, though, between us, maybe, Richard, which is I actually perceive that one of the problems has been that we've been too forgetful of the institution as opposed to the individual, that we're looking too much for... To, the question I always get, you know, and I'm asked about uh, the big lie, stop the steal or QAnon, is always something like, so how do we reach these individuals? How do we persuade these people? How do we bring them as individuals back into the fold of reality? And we think to come back to where we started of the marketplace of ideas as a conversation between individuals unmediated. I think that's kind of how Mill thought about it. Yeah. You know, I engage you and we both learn. We correct each other. Well, that's great. But I perceived actually the shortfall was in the other direction, that we were forgetting all of the structures that we've got to build around ourselves so that we can be our better selves and not our worst selves. That's the Madisonian side as opposed to the Lincolnian side. So I thought that that's actually where the emphasis should go as between these two crucial things. Yeah. And actually, as, as I listen to you, I, you know, I think the evidence is more on your side, certainly in kind of recent years. If you take this view, the utopian view of the, you know, the virtuous individual who's able to do all this stuff on their own, then the Internet and social media would have been the wonderful agora for the creation of human knowledge that the utopians thought it would be. The fact that it hasn't turned out that way at all speaks more to your side of the argument, which is absent the correct institutional framings and channels and restraints and incentives that actually are sort of a landscape sandblasted of institutions and just left to the individuals turns out not to be great for that kind of truth-seeking behavior. So certainly recent years would point in your direction. Um, I guess the jury's out yet on how much better we might get. You know, we were all caught a bit by surprise. But listening to you now and thinking about the history of the last few years, I think that is a fair criticism of my position that it's too utopian about the ability of individuals to manage to be virtuous, absent institutions that promote and reward that virtue, and that we haven't paid enough attention to those. And then we just got all these new things happened, and we, we're scrambling to create the institutions around this new... Yeah, so, yeah, I think I think there's um, a lot of truth in what you say. You've definitely moved me. If we had another hour, maybe we'd move. But I've kept you for a long time, John. And if I read your um, essay on introversion correctly, we've we've gone for a, over an hour. And you said in that essay something like, every hour of social interaction requires you to take two hours to recover and uh, get your batteries up. So I don't know if you're alone. You're probably not. Michael's probably waiting in the wings. So you may not get your two hours, but... I, I now I've taken three hours of your time, the hour of talking and the two hours of recovery. So I'm hugely I, grateful. I say, Richard, I, I have looked forward to this conversation at least a week, even more so after hearing you and John Haidt talk so brilliantly about some of the same issues. And just frankly, sitting at the same table with you guys and, and having a, taking part in this conversation is an honor. So I'm thrilled to do it. And no, this does not count as socializing time. What introverts get tired by is small talk. Well, this was talk that's not about anything. This, this was, was mostly, not small talk. This was mostly <laughs> pretty big talk. So. This was pretty big talk. <laughs> if anything, talk. we got a little bit too abstract. I feel a little, no, 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 no such thing on dialogues. No, 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 no such thing. Um, and we'll add links to everything you've said. So, uh, John, thanks again for joining. I really appreciate it. I loved it. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. 
And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.